That's some good singing. You can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We'll be there in just a second. But let me start with this because I won't come back to this later. I want you to know this if you don't. Jesus is the Messiah sent from the Father to live among men for a time. Teach us about the Father and the Father's ways and the kingdom of the Father. And then He died on the cross because of the horrible sins of mankind. Sinners just like me. It is my sins that put him there. And then he was buried in a tomb of stone. And on the third day, on a Sunday, he was raised from the dead. If you haven't heard the good news that that happened, and it happened for you, for me, for all of us. He died so we could live. He bore our sins so we could be forgiven of our sins. He rose from the dead so we could conquer our own grave someday. Now you have. And if you haven't done anything about that good news, if you've never acted upon that, responded to it, then this is a good day to change all of that. And I would encourage you, believe the good news about Jesus. More than just hearing it, put your faith in Him. Do what He says. Do what His servants, His messengers said. Like Peter who said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you've never heard that... Now you've heard it, and please respond to that as he has said. But the rest of the time I want to talk to the church because most of this is written for the church. So let's focus our attention on this letter that we call Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We've been studying it for just a little while now. Paul is writing to the church about the church to encourage the church because the church is important. When it comes to the good news and telling the world about the good news of Jesus, the church is important. When it comes to salvation and people coming to salvation through Jesus, the church is important. When it comes to the purpose of heaven and the hope of eternity and the opportunity for normal, messed up, sinful people like me and you to be brought together, given meaning and purpose and identity, the church is important. When thinking about history and the important characters in it, Stott writes, while much historical study focuses on prime ministers, presidents, politicians, and generals, the Bible concentrates on insignificant people who are at the very same time God's people, a multinational community called the church, which has no territorial frontiers, which claims nothing less than the whole world for Christ, and whose empire will never come to an end. The church is central to the gospel. And even as we all consider and acknowledge that the church is full of messed up people like me, who truly do get it wrong, they fail, they make mistakes, they sin, they dishonor God. And if you don't know, we at Brookline are fully aware we don't always do church well either. Still, and pay attention to this, still, it is surprisingly wonderful that Jesus has not yet given up on his church. Stott goes on to say, God has not abandoned his church. However displeased with it he may be, he is still building it and refining it. And if God has not abandoned it, how could we? So don't give up on church. Up until this point, if you know what Paul's been writing, he's written about the church and the blessings that are found in Christ, about grace and faith, about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He's spoken recently about the mystery that's been revealed that Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles alike can now have the blessing, the access to the Father, the promise of Christ, the same unifying Spirit. And now he's about to speak of another subject that if you've been paying attention already in our worship, you will have heard it in the first scripture, in the second scripture, in nearly every song. It's in his essential part of Christianity, and maybe you already know what he's going to write. Let's begin reading. Chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason, Paul writes, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I kneel, Paul writes. Is, is it a shame that we don't kneel when we pray anymore? You don't have to answer that, just wondering. The bodily posture in prayer is mentioned several times in the scripture. This one, oh, there's others, lifting holy hands, standing there for Jesus, falling on your face. But this kneeling, other churches still do it. If you know the history of the churches of Christ, we used to do it. Maybe, as some suggested, we're too proud to do it anymore. Maybe we've just lost the tradition. Maybe it's just inconvenient and that's all. Maybe we just don't think about it. 
But Paul does think about it, and Paul does it even if you say right now as he's writing, it's more metaphorical, but it's real, it's real, it's true. He says he gets down on his knees in prayer, and he does it for this family, the family, the family of God, the church. What is he praying for? Keep reading. I pray that out of his, God's glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. To go back to near the beginning of the letter, he writes all about the blessings, the riches that we have in Christ. That's where it's going to come from. These riches in the storehouse of God's riches from the one who owns the cattle on the thousand hill, for the one who made everything and owns everything. He is the one who gives this. And what is he asking for? For these people of God's strength <clears throat> and power. He wants the Lord to strengthen all of them with power, power through the Holy Spirit, right where he dwells. Where is that? In them, within them, right there in their inner being, in the core of who they are. That's where he is, his power, power in you because he is in you. Power, power, that word gets us going. That word gets us thinking. It maybe gets us dreaming. Power. If we could have power, if we could have the full power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God within us, within us, what could we do? What could we accomplish? Do you know how much we could get done if we could change everything with that kind of power? Well, start thinking because it's true. Start dreaming because it's a reality. But before you get too far ahead of yourself and start thinking about all the, about all the things you could dream about doing, first understand what God's desire is for you. And when you understand that you have that kind of power within you because of the Spirit, what are you supposed to do with it? Now, go back to Paul and remember what Paul is saying. Do you know what he's about to say, by the way? If God has one desire for you, if God could give you His Spirit, and He has, and the power of the Spirit, and He has, to do anything you could, what would He want you to do? Do you know? I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted, that's agricultural language, and established, that's construction language, in love may have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Follow the that's in this passage. Paul prays that they would be strengthened with power through the Spirit. That Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. That they would be rooted and established in love. That they would have power for all, with all who are in Christ. Yes, 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 Paul, to do what? Of all the things we could do with that kind of power from that Spirit, the Holy Spirit, do you see what He wants you to do? First, foremost, is not so much to go out and do incredible miracles, although that would be cool if I could. Not to cure cancer of every person who's ever had it. Not to go to the hospital and heal every sickness of everyone who doesn't deserve it. Not to go to the cemetery and raise all of the dead, even though all of that would be amazing. You see what he wants you to be able to do? Pay attention because Paul thinks this is really important. And Paul believes God knows this is really important, fundamental to Christianity. What are we to do with that kind of power? What in the world are we going to do with that? To grasp, to understand, to hold on to, to get it in here and in here, to have it. What is it? Now, before we go on, you should know that Paul does not include the object in his original Greek as he writes. The King James does a better uh, job here than the NIV if you want to leave it as it really was written. Accurately like this, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height of what? That. All of that. Of, of what? Open for discussion. You can do your own research, come to your own conclusion, but the NIV gives its interpretation and you might agree with it because he's just talked about love and he's goes on to talk about love. So right in the middle of this, is it possible he's talking about love? I think that's appropriate. But consider this. He's not asking for measurements here. He's pleading for perspective. 
to grasp how high, wide, deep, long is the love of Christ. He's not suggesting we actually try to measure it out and write it down on a piece of paper. But to know it, to know love, this love, fully grasp it, fully get it, fully comprehend it. Not so much in here as in here. Because this love, it goes beyond what's in here. It goes beyond knowledge. You can't fully get your mind around it. You just have to appreciate it, if you can. And it's interesting, isn't it, that he's asking and praying that we would know what is really unknowable, that we would measure and understand what is really limitless, infinite, and unfathomable. He's asking to do the impossible. Pray for the impossible. Just yesterday, I asked Alexis to go out with the measuring tape and measure the, uh, the, the, the grill on our back porch because I have to get a new cover. It's ripped up, and we've thrown it away. So she went out and did that. Uh, Chance, would you come help me here? We're going to measure the auditorium real quick, so just hang on. We'll start with the stage. Go, go put that on that wall, just that one on the stage. We're going to measure the stage first. And it, yeah, just put it right on the wall. That's good. It appears the stage is 12 feet. Good, thank you. Why don't you go that way? Or let's start on the wall right here. Sorry. Right. We didn't rehearse this. <laughs> and it is good job. 12 feet. Good. And if I, if I, thank you. If I were to hoist him up and he could reach the ceiling, do you know how long it would be? 12 feet. So the stage itself is about 12 by 12 by 12. Because apparently that's, that's the, as long as this goes. <laughs> And I'm, I'm certain, I'm certain since our measuring tape is only 12 feet, as it says, it's bigger than that. I mean, I think we can all tell it's bigger than that. Uh, this, this auditorium by itself is more than, more than my tape measure can hold. It's more than it can comprehend. It's more sometimes than my mind can go, but not the auditorium, but more than that. Like if I took a measuring tape, even one that could reach to the Grand Canyon. Have you been there? And if I stretch it out from end to end and then put it down to the bottom and put it all the way up, can you, can you see how big it is? Not, not the numbers. Can you see the magnificence of it? If, if I went to, the, to, to Niagara Falls with you and we stood there, have you been there and just watched the water? And if I could say how many cups go over that every minute, you would be amazed. But, but it doesn't really capture the sight and the sound, the experience of that. And I, if I could send you, and I can't, to the very last star in the universe, because I can't, I can't fathom that. It's some 13 to 30 billion light years away, and that's not the end. No measuring tape goes that far. Our telescopes don't go that far. Don't you understand how, how big we're talking about? We're talking about God and His love. I mean, how do, you, how do you measure that? Certainly not with 12-foot tape. It doesn't even do a stage right. How do you measure God and how big He is and how much He loves? I can't get my 12-feet head around that idea, and yet that is exactly what Paul is praying for. Barnes says, It was love which led the Son of God to become incarnate. To leave the heavens, to be a man of sorrows, to be reviled and persecuted, to be put to death in the most shameful manner on a cross. Who can understand that? Where else had there been anything like that? Where was there with which we could compare it to? What would there be that we could be illustrating it with? How could we fully understand it? Yet something of it might be seen, might be known, might be felt. The apostle, as far as possible, says they should understand the great love which the Lord Jesus has manifested for a dying world. That's what Barnes wrote. The love of Christ. The love of God in Christ. Could we get there? Can we understand that? Can we get that? If all of us together could wrap our minds around it, if we as a church, together with all of the church that meets all over the world today, worldwide, could we fill our minds with the unmeasurable love of Christ and understand it so that we could be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? I think not. As one commentator said, it's like taking a cup of water to the ocean and scooping up all the way to the fullest part of the cup and saying, I have contained the ocean in my cup. 
It's ridiculous. How can we even get our minds around this? Love that is that big, love that is that powerful, love, not some mamsy pamsy feel good, bless your heart, kind of hug a panda love. This is real love. This is true love. This isn't what talked about in Hollywood or in Washington. This is sacrificial kind of die on a cross love for sinners like me, and that blows my mind. This is the kind of love that defines him and describes him and moves him to act for me so that I wouldn't have to spend an eternity in hell where I deserve to be, but instead he has invited me to be in heaven where he is and always will be through Christ. And that's grace. That's mercy. That's a miracle. That's amazing. That is the love of God that must never become old to us. And if we could somehow spend every waking minute doing nothing else but trying, just trying to understand how wide and deep and long and high and appreciate that kind of love, that would be time well spent. Unfortunately, sometimes I think maybe, maybe we come to church, we sing a few songs, we read a few scriptures, and we talk about the love of God, and we walk away sometimes unchanged by the message, by the truth, by the reality. And on the days we haven't really thought about it, haven't spent any time dwelling on it, haven't taken so much as a heartbeat to even consider that, then it hasn't changed us. And we can come here and go home and nothing has changed. And on those days, what I am still amazed at, on those days when I am at my worst, he still loves me. Thankfully, while well, too many times I've given up the task of even trying to fully appreciate His love for me, that same kind of love has not given up on me. It makes His love then even more incredible, unbelievable, because on my worst days, He loves me then. But if I could get it, if on my best day I truly could appreciate it, His love for me, His love for us, then I am convinced we would be changed by it. And we just might be different kind of people. We might be a better kind of church. We might be a real instrument of God for telling the world, telling everybody, you have got to get your mind around this idea that God loves you that much. And that's our message, and that's our hope, and that's the good news for the world. It's changed us. It certainly ought to be able to change every single human if they could just understand it. And the way in which the world could be changed by it is the church getting the word out. Even in heaven itself, it ought to hear the message that the church is telling. Go back and read verse 10 and you'll see it. Because the hope of the world still is the message of God that gets out by the way of the church. That's his purpose. Church is important. But oh, to be filled. It's not ours to do the filling. It is his. It's an act of God. But it's ours to pray it, to ask for it, to desire it. Oh, to be filled with God, overflowing with Jesus, overfilled with the Spirit. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. Does that explain, describe us? It should. On this Memorial Day weekend, I hope you are mindful of those who have given their lives for us in this country, those who have served and fought and given the ultimate sacrifice, died. Remember them and be grateful. I hope sometime tomorrow you'll take a little time to just consider what they have done. When Winston Churchill spoke to his countrymen on August 21st, 1940, maybe you've heard the speech. It's the beginning of World War II, not our part in it, really. But he spoke very bravely, he spoke very powerfully of the brave pilots of the RAF, the Royal Air Force. So many of them had died, still fighting, just to keep the Germans away from them. And he said this, maybe you've heard the quote, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Now I want to repeat that today because in this country, some brave men and women have given the ultimate price for our freedom. Let's be truly grateful to them, for them, grateful to God for this, what we have. <laughs> But I also want you to think about the one, not the relatively few, but the one who gave everything, even his own life, so that we could not be saved for some freedom, 
but so that we could be saved from our sins, from damnation, so that we could truly live. He did not provide salvation from a mortal enemy, but from hell itself, from sin and death and punishment. Never, ever have, never, ever have so many owed so much to one. And I hope we spend the rest of our lives being grateful for that one. Maybe you've heard on the radio, Joseph Habedank, he wrote and sang this song. And he, in an interview, said, I, I, you want to be careful not to put words in God's mouth, not to have Jesus saying things that you think he should have said. But he tried to get a handle on this, what Jesus had done. So he wrote this song and he sings and it's like this. I left my home. These are Jesus' words in some ways. I left my home. I came so far from where I was to where you are. The bitter tears, the lonely ache, the many ways a heart could break. And you were at the center of it all to free you from the prison of the fall. I took your guilt, I bore your shame, and I would do it all again. My open arms reached out in grace to pull you in to love's embrace. It's been spoken in a thousand different ways, yet the cross said more than words could ever say. There was no hill too steep for me to climb, no road too long or hard to make you mine. I gave all I had to give, and it was worth the cost to say I love you from an old rugged cross. Can you hear the echoes from that hill? I loved you then, and child, I love you still. I don't, I don't know that we can fully understand, comprehend, grasp the great love of God through Christ for us. But it should be our prayer. It should be our desire. So let me pray for you as we close. You can keep your eyes open. Maybe it's not a traditional prayer. It's not even my prayer. It's Paul's prayer. Could I read this for you? Could I say this for you? Would God grant our prayer that this would be true of us? I pray that you, you would be strengthened with power through the Spirit. That Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith that you would be rooted and established in love, that you would have the power with all of the saints who are in Christ so that you could all together grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge and that you may be filled to the measure of all of the fullness of God. And may that be true of us today. Let's stand and sing. Come if you need to.